In today's video, we'll be talking about exothermic and endothermic reactions. By the end of today's video, you should understand that there are many ways to categorize chemical reactions. One of these ways is by the direction of heat transfer. You should also understand how can heat transfer take place, and what exactly are exothermic and endothermic reactions. Let's start by recognizing that there are many ways to categorize chemical reactions. We can categorize chemical reactions by smell, whether or not it produces products that smells good or if it doesn't. By precipitation, this is whether or not mixing of two clear liquids result in the formation of an insoluble solid. By the different sound that they produce, whether it explodes or if it fizzes. By the different colored flames that the reaction produces. Or by the direction of heat transfer, does it release heat into the surrounding or does it absorb heat from the surrounding? And this is going to be the focus of today's video. Let us first look at two ways to categorize chemical reactions in a little more detail, just to show that there are other ways of categorizing chemical reactions other than heat transfer. Let's look at smell and precipitation. Categorizing chemical reactions by smell. As noted earlier, this is usually done in terms of whether or not it produces good smells or bad smells. Example of a chemical reaction that produces bad smell is the thermal decomposition of ammonium salt, and this produces pungent smell. If you heat up an ammonium salt, such as ammonium chloride, it decomposes into hydrogen chloride and ammonia gas, and ammonia gas has a distinct pungent smell. On the other hand, the chemical reaction of esterification produces fruity smell. Esterification is a reaction between two organic compounds, carboxylic acid such as ethanoic acid and alcohol such as ethanol. When these two are heated under reflux conditions, it results in the formation of ester, and in this specific case, it produces ethyl ethanoid and water. Ethyl ethanoid, as you can see from this icon over here, smells a bit like pear. We can also categorize chemical reactions by precipitation. Now, in chemistry, the meaning of precipitation differs somewhat from the mainstream definition of precipitation, which usually refers to the process of condensation during rainfall. But in chemistry, precipitation usually refers to the formation of an insoluble solid in an otherwise clear solution. The mixing of lithium nitrate and sodium hydroxide solutions is an example of a reaction that produces no precipitate. Right? So you start off with two clear solutions and you end up with a clear mixture. So you can't tell whether this reaction has taken place or not by watching out for precipitation. On the other hand, the reaction between copper sulfate and sodium hydroxide solutions result in the formation of copper hydroxide precipitate, which is a very distinct blue precipitate. On to the focus of today's video, categorizing chemical reactions by way of heat transfer. There are two categories here. We have chemical reactions that releases heat into the surroundings, known as exothermic reactions. The most famous category of exothermic reactions would probably be combustion reactions. All combustion reactions, without exception, are exothermic. For example, the combustion of methane in the presence of oxygen. So the combustion of methane in the presence of oxygen results in the formation of carbon dioxide and water, and this process releases a huge amount of heat energy. We also have reactions that absorb heat from the surroundings, known as endothermic reactions. One example of this would be the dissolution of ammonium salts in water. Ammonium salts such as ammonium nitrate crystals in water to form ammonium nitrate solution. This is a reaction that absorbs heat from the surrounding into the chemical system. Now let's look in a little more detail and understand how does heat actually get transferred in and out of chemical systems. How can heat be transferred during a reaction? The law of conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be converted from one form to another form. For heat energy to be transferred, there must be another type of energy that is converted into heat energy. What is this other type of energy? To understand this, we need to know that in chemical molecules, energy is stored in the form of chemical bonds. The energy stored within the chemical bonds of reactants and products are known as enthalpy, denoted by capital H. This is a bit of a white line. The definition of enthalpy is a little bit more complicated than this, 
But thinking of enthalpy as the energy stored within reactants and product molecules should suffice for this video. During a chemical reaction, chemical bonds are both broken and formed. More specifically, the chemical bonds of reactants are broken and this process requires energy which is absorbed from the surroundings. On the other hand, during the formation of bonds of the products, energy is released into the surroundings. So far, we have not really seen how can heat energy be transferred. Although energy is absorbed during the breaking of bonds, but it seems to be cancelled out by the energy released during the formation of bonds. So why would there be leftover energy to be transferred? Well, it turns out that in the vast majority of chemical reactions, the magnitude of energy absorbed is almost always not equal to the magnitude of energy release. So this imbalance between the magnitude of energy absorbed and the energy release leads to a change in enthalpy or an enthalpy change denoted by delta H. Now the value of delta H is the magnitude of energy that is transferred. Let's better understand this with an example of an exothermic reaction. We will revisit the combustion reaction of methane in the presence of oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. Recall from earlier that during a chemical reaction, energy needs to be absorbed in order to break the chemical bond. So in this specific chemical reaction, energy is absorbed from the surroundings in order to break the bonds of methane and the bonds within oxygen. Whereas when the bonds of carbon dioxide and water are formed, energy is released from the chemical system into the surroundings. So you might notice that the reactants and the products differ in quite a few ways. Most notably, they have different types of chemical bonds. The reactants have four carbon-hydrogen single bonds, two oxygen-oxygen double bonds, whereas the products has two carbon-oxygen double bonds and four oxygen-hydrogen single bonds. Recall from earlier that chemical energy are stored within the chemical bonds. So if the type of chemical bonds are different, it would stand to reason that the magnitude of energy stored within them would also be different. And this is exactly the case. Scientists can experimentally measure these values known as bond energies. Using these bond energies, we can calculate how much energy is absorbed in order to break the bond in any chemical reaction, uh, in this case during the combustion of methane, and how much energy is released during the formation of the bonds within carbon dioxide and water. And you can see that these two values aren't exactly the same. There is more energy release than there is energy absorbed. But where would this excess energy go to? Before we explain that, let's do a quick recap. During this chemical reaction, the energy is absorbed in order to break the bonds. Energy is released in order to form the bonds. We see that the energy absorbed and the energy released are different in magnitude. The difference between them is what is known as the enthalpy change. So the difference between them is roughly about 800 kilojoules per mole. This is the amount of energy that is transferred. But in what direction would it be transferred? Would it be transferred out of the chemical system into the surroundings or from the surroundings into the chemical system? For this, we refer to the sign of the enthalpy change. It's a negative. Negative means that the energy is transferred out of the chemical system into the surroundings. And this also makes intuitive sense. After all, there is more energy released than there is energy absorbed. So the energy can't move from the surroundings into the system, right? Because there is more energy that's being released. So the excess energy that is not cancelled out by the energy absorbed would be the energy that is transferred into the surroundings. Reactions which releases heat into the surroundings are called exothermic reactions. What are endothermic reactions? Now that we understand what exothermic reactions are, understanding what endothermic reactions are is relatively straightforward. It is just the opposite. If exothermic reactions are reactions in which the energy absorbed by bond breaking being smaller in magnitude compared to the energy released by bond formation, then for endothermic reactions, there must be reactions where the energy absorbed during the breaking of bonds of reactants exceed the magnitude of energy released during the formation of bonds of products. We have already looked at one example of this earlier during the dissolution of ammonium nitrate crystals in water to form ammonium nitrate solution. During this reaction, energy is absorbed 
to break the ionate bonds between the ammonium ion and the nitrate ions. Energy is later released during the formation of weak bonds between the ammonium ions, nitrate ions with the surrounding water molecules. Now, for this reaction to be endothermic, which value must be greater in magnitude? You would be right if you think that the left should be greater than the right. right? There must be more energy absorbed than the energy released for there to be net flow of energy from the surroundings into the system. In fact, this reaction is exploited in instant coal packs. You might know this as ice packs that do not need to be pre-chilled in freezers before using them. The way it works is that in this large pack, there are smaller packs of water and ammonium nitrates crystals packed in small packets that are easy to break by squeezing this larger pack. When you squeeze this larger pack, the ammonium nitrate crystals and water come into contact with each other, resulting in the dissolution of ammonium nitrate crystals in water, which as we know, is an endothermic reaction which absorbs heat from the surroundings. So far, we have looked at heat transfer in the context of chemical reactions. However, heat transfer is not just limited to chemical reactions, it can also occur in physical processes such as state of matter transitions. Here, we will look at an example using the three states of matter of H2O, ice, water, and water vapor to exemplify how heat transfer can also occur in physical processes. The process of melting is an endothermic process, and you would already intuitively know this when you reach for ice cubes to cool down a glass of water during a hot day. The reason why ice cubes can cool down a glass of water is because the ice cube absorbs energy from the surrounding, in this case it's the glass of water, and the energy is used to break the bonds within the molecules of ice. So that's why the glass of water cools down. Evaporation and boiling are also endothermic processes. The fact that evaporation is endothermic is the reason why sweating cools us down. When we sweat, energy in the form of heat is absorbed from our body and it's transferred into the molecules of sweat in order to break the bonds between these molecules of sweat for them to become water vapor. So when sweat evaporates, it takes heat energy away from our body. And that's why sweating cools us down. The reverse of evaporation and boiling, i.e. condensation, is an exothermic process. And you would know this if you have ever been scalded by steam. The reason why steam burns is that when steam comes into contact with a surface, specifically a cooler surface such as your skin, steam molecules lose kinetic energy and they come together close enough for bonds to form between them. Recall from earlier that the formation of bond is a process that is exothermic in nature, meaning it releases heat to the surroundings, and in this case, the surroundings is your skin. Perhaps a bit counterintuitively, the process of freezing is also an exothermic process. You might have noticed before that the, the back of your freezer or your refrigerator is rather hot. And the reason why the back of a freezer is hot is because the way a freezer works is that it takes the heat energy that is within the system, in this case it's the freezer, and it pumps this heat energy out of the system into the surroundings. The process where heat energy is transferred from within a system into the surroundings is an exothermic process. Let's do a recap of everything that we have covered so far. You should know by now that chemical reactions can be categorized in various ways, one of which is by the direction of heat transfer. You should also know that chemical energy within molecules are stored within chemical bonds, and different chemical bonds contain different magnitudes of energies. During a chemical reaction, Bonds in reactant molecules are broken, whereas chemical bonds in products are formed. The process of breaking bonds is one that absorbs energy, whereas the process of forming bonds is one that releases energy. If less energy is absorbed than release, then there will be net heat energy released into the surroundings, and we call this kind of reactions exothermic. On the other hand, if more energy is absorbed than release, then there will be net energy flow from the surroundings into the chemical system. Heat will therefore be absorbed, and we call these kind of reactions endothermic reactions.